Speaking of insubordination brings us to our featured speaker of the evening, Dr. John Hunt. He, like many other people, sent me a book, a copy of his book called Assume the Physician with some beautiful picture of sheep on the front cover. And I thought, oh, well, okay, somebody, somebody else sent me a book. I will page through it and read a few pages. And I just kept reading and reading and reading. And I fell in love with his insubordinate protagonist who um, had a lot of delightful ideas that will appeal to us. He loved his patients, I think here, and also in Africa, where he has a charitable mission and has some really interesting proposals that I think you would appeal to you. I, I hope you will buy his book and let him sign it, but I do warn you, you should not read it on the way home if you feel that you might be embarrassed if you're caught laughing out loud in public on the airplane. Dr. John Hunt is a pediatrician, an allergist, immunologist, and a pulmonologist, and he will speak to you now. Thank you. My topic is all hell, and it actually is particularly important right now because I was going to talk about Nazis. Um, and Dr. Orient has already kind of covered the Nazis, but I'm still going to briefly mention them. I'm also going to take, keep notes with me, which I don't think I've ever done. I've probably done about 200 or more academic presentations in one form or another. And I'm one of those people who, if, you, if I was thrust into a group, I would be grouped into narcissistic academic. But I don't think I'm narcissistic, but most academics are, and so I'd have to be thrust into that group with them. The academics are the ones who run all the academies, for the most part, and so it's not shocking that they run them the way they want to run them and the way they think the whole world should be run. And those are our representatives for our specialties, and those are the ones who go to Congress and report, and it's a big, horrible system that we need to contend with over time. But I do love being a physician. I think it's the most noble profession on the planet. And I love being a physician now when we have things like this, which I have one of these things in my pocket right now. If you haven't seen this thing yet, it's, uh, it's a little uh, rhythm strip generator. They call it an EKG, but it's a single lead um, that you can just touch your fingers to it and you get a rhythm strip and you can do this, use this in an individualized patient basis. Your patient can buy it for themselves for 200 bucks and they can track when they have uh, PVCs or by Gemini and sort out what they've got. We have tools, more and more tools that are coming along to make our whole world a heck of a lot more individualized. At a time when the political system is trying to collectivize us like crazy, the internet and the people who are inventing stuff are still trying to individualize us and they're gonna win and that's a wonderful time to be practicing. Eric Topol, do you all know Eric Topol yet? Yeah, Eric Topol seems to have a very individualized bent and yes he's from San Diego. <laughs> uh, um, and at least to me, he seems to have an individualized mentality, and, um, and I don't know his politics in detail, but it, the way he talks, it's about individualization. Um, and that's a very encouraging thing now that he's the new editor-in-chief of Medscape, which is the most popular place that any doctor goes to get information. So we could have some, somebody on our side. Would that be fair enough? Fair enough. Okay, good, good. <clears throat> My patients are probably different than most people's patients, although probably all of us or most of us have at some time had an opportunity to take care of some of the most um, impoverished folk on the planet. I work in Liberia, West Africa. That's the only place I practice. Um, I quit medicine in the United States about three years ago. Um, and I quit, um, well, it might have been four years ago, actually. I quit before Obamacare. I quit because the previous system prior to Obamacare I thought sucked so bad. And, and I took my, the skills that I'd gone through and I hate to say it, 27 years of training um, and applied mostly none of that to my practice in West Africa. I'm a, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist and an allergist immunologist and I went over to West Africa where I take care of burns and I provide fertility counseling and just general medical stuff right and left. I don't have any x-ray machine, I don't have any laboratory tests to speak of and I commit malpractice probably 40% of the time that I'm there. <coughs> But the patients get better. I give them a lot of different medications that you wouldn't give in the States, but they generally get better. And my kids, the patients are just kind of wonderful patients. They're happy, they're free. There's very few rules except what their parents make for them. And I mean, this is a typical ward at one of the hospitals. And one thing that they do is that they carry their own medical record with them. 
We have no problem with medical records. We don't need an electronic health record. We don't have anything like that. The patient always has their medical record with them. Now, these people have no money. They have no education. Their country is demolished. They have very little electricity, if at all. They have very poor water supplies. They have no sewage anywhere. But they carry their medical record. Why can't Americans do that? Why can't we? Pretty simple stuff. We solve a lot of problems if people just have responsibility, right? One of the reasons I also named this whole topic Ah uh, Hell is because I'm pre really preaching to the choir. You guys all agree with everything I'm gonna say up front, and so why do I even bother to say it? I'm just gonna say it with a different angle. My patients are happy, as I said. They're like sometimes really, really happy. And it's important because they're happy because they're free. Um, they also, this lack of rules is something interesting. We have a lot of rules in our country. People love to make rules, and this is one of the most common rules that we have out there. Now, only a lawyer could come up with that rule, and only a lawyer and doctors would believe it. Because why would anybody believe something as irrational and as illogical as this rule? Why do we live by this? And I'm sorry to any lawyers that are around. And yet that rule is there. Liberia doesn't have rules to speak of, but there's a few. Um, the Liberian rules are a little bit different. Here's a Liberian rule. Don't park your canoe here. It's an important Liberian rule, but of course it gets ignored the same way that don't park your car here gets ignored over and over again. Now there's, there's, it says no parking up here and no parking, and then what you can't read, kind of like right there, those two things they say, do not pee pee on this wall. <laughs> and that rule gets ignored also, very much. So absent rules, what happens? Liberia has very few rules. And the reason it has very few rules is because the country, the, I'm sorry, the government has no money. The government is relatively powerless. It has a constitution not terribly different than ours, but the government has a $300 million a year budget for a 4 million population, and it's all occupied with doing some of the basic stuff. And they just don't have the power to enforce anything. So it's a libertarian country, and if you want to be free, go there. Now, the problem with it is it got demolished by a 16-year civil war, and it was pretty ugly. The whole, the whole country was torn to shreds. It looked like Lebanon at its worst. And, but when the country came back and when the peace was restored, the government has always been weak. Now, it's interesting that the government has a $300 million budget, but it does not have any debt. The government does not have debt. And the government is powerless. Our country and our government of our country has a somewhere between a $16 trillion and a $200 trillion debt. It should be significantly less powerful than the government of Liberia, because at least the government of Liberia is not in the hole. But somehow our government's incredibly powerful, and we'll touch base on that again, because there's a core problem in our society that has nothing to do with medical care, but it causes all the problems with our medical system. And we'll touch back on that. But what happens in Liberia when rules are not there? Catastrophe, catastrophe like this. How can you have an Ingliski edition? If we had rules to protect that, we could have avoided an Ingliski edition of the old Scrablet game. But there's not a whole lot else that goes really bad as far as things. But if you do have rules, some bad things can happen. Like this. So the wars in Liberia, there were 16 years of civil conflict. It, it was wars between narcissistic tyrants and narcissistic rebel leaders vying for power. It was a pile of socialists fight, I'm, I'm sorry, sociopaths fighting against each other. And it was very easy for people to get upset at the tyrant who was running the country at the time and sign on with a tyrant who was running a rebel group. And there was a bunch of the rebel groups. And the result of these battles back and forth between these charis highly charismatic Charles Taylor people, highly charismatic narcissists, ended up with this being what was left of the major port in West, in West Africa. This being the Hotel Africa, which was the biggest and finest hotel that, there w that existed in the Sub-Saharan region. And the requirement for the UN to come in, and one of the few things I think the UN ever, has ever done pretty well, which was um, tyrannically restore the peace in Liberia when there was a bunch of narcissists taken off. One thing I learned from this is that you really, really don't want a charismatic narcissist in any position of power. Yeah. So <clears throat> these are my feet, and this is my feet after a day of clinic. 
this is how we do things in West Africa and some in the poorest parts of West Africa. <laughs> if you wear socks, you sweat up a storm, you get dehydrated and your, so and your clothes soak. I found that keeping socks off my feet is the way to do it. And I only wear Crocs, although I wear socks today just for you guys, usually I wouldn't. But I do wear Crocs because nothing else is really comfortable over there. <laughs> I forgot to give my mandatory conflict of interest statement, which all academic presentations need to begin with. And so this is mine, um, and you can read it. Um, that's pretty much all I ever say, except I do present my biases. And I do want to talk about my bias for a second, because my bias has to do with my morality. And you can read that for a second, laugh a little bit. My morality is kind of central, and, and I might I'm supposed to be a writer and I'm supposed to use words correctly and I don't know if it's my morality or my value structure that I'm about to refer to, but it's a consistent morality that you probably all share, which is the core libertarian concept of um, no initiation of force or fraud is acceptable. And that I have, after much fuss and bother and much contemplation decided, that is what I relate everything to. It is good or bad in my mind based on whether there's an initiation of force or fraud central to my all my thinking <clears throat> but we live in a world that is dominated by force and fraud so how does a guy like me how do people like you survive in it or thrive in it and it's difficult i mean how many libertarians do you know who are wealthy very few ever and i think it's just because we don't do very well in a society filled with force and fraud how many people know doug casey Doug Casey is known. Yeah, Doug Casey is a good friend of mine, and he's a, a wonderful, wealthy libertarian. Well, he's kind of an anarchist, so I guess that's how he got wealthy. Um, he's a, a speculator, gold mining speculator, research, uh, researches uh, financial issues. This is the central fraud, I think, that's in our country. You probably are all aware of this, but I'm going to bounce it off a few people. Perhaps some medical students haven't had time to, to learn that the Federal Reserve is, is probably the underlying central biggest risk to America that exists. And you, again, to those who know this, I, I apologize. To those who don't know this, if you haven't considered the, the Federal Reserve to be the biggest risk to America ever, then I'd ask you to think about it a little bit, because I don't say it at all calmly, and I don't say it all off the cuff either. Without the Federal Reserve, our United States government would be essentially powerless. It would be an, an entity with 16 trillion to 200 trillion dollars in of debt and we would laugh at anything it tried to tell us to do with the federal reserve and with the united states currency as the reserve currency of the world they can print an unlimited amount of currency basically stealing our money through inflation and un provide unlimited power to the united states government if you want to find the core problem in our country it is the federal reserve and the fiat currency that it has created it's something that if you don't know and don't understand it spend a few years figuring it out because there's no way to beat it. There's no way to beat it without understanding it. This is uh, Rothschild, the founder of the Rothschild International Banking Community, and he was actually the founder of international banking, a lot of people say. And he had this quote to say, which I think is very important one to pay heed to. You can control the money, control the money, and you can control the lawmakers. It doesn't matter what the lawmakers do. I'm not particularly fond of Rothschild. Um, and some of his descendants were not just sociopaths, but outright full-fledged psychopaths, which I guess is almost the same thing. Um, but I prefer kind of another guy. I prefer uh, that guy. He's a lot wiser character in my mind, and he always had good things to say, and if he didn't say it, we'd attribute all good things to him anyhow. And Mark Twain said this. He said, against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. Or at least it was attributed to him, because all good things are attributed to Mark Twain. So what I've tried to do is, as opposed to just suffer miserably in my discontent, trying to work through a, a libertarian life and ideology within a system in the nation filled with fraud and force, I decided to just try to make people laugh about it. Because satire is a wonderful way to get people to bust through their own denial. And if there's a group of people on the planet who are in denial, it's the people who believe that they're right all the time. And the people who believe that they're right all the time are the ones who seem to be propelling us and pushing all this stuff down our throats. So I wanted to make them laugh. And I never once in my life used a rational methodology to convince a progressive that they might be wrong. It just doesn't work. You can't kind of rationally communicate. And I think it's because within their frame of reference, within their ideology, everything makes sense to them. 
It's okay to be utilitarian if you're a, if you're a progressive. It's okay to use force to accomplish an aim that they consider to be good. It's not okay for me, but since it's okay for them, there's no logical, rational argument I can use to convince them that their, their ways are errant. Trying to say things like, you know, I'm not going to force you to do anything if I say that to them. That's irrelevant to them. They don't care if I'm not going to force them. They only care whether I'm going to do what they want them, what, whether I'm going to do what they want me to do or not. <laughs> um, you know, I think I forgot to start this talk with a joke. Wasn't I supposed to start a talk with a joke? That's another thing academics always do, and it's usually a pretty sucky joke, so I'll give you a pretty sucky joke. <clears throat> Last weekend, I read a book about anti-gravity. I couldn't put it down. <laughs> and today I was at a bookstore, and there was this heavy, thick book on weightlifting, so I picked it up. <clears throat> Words are important, and it's fun to write them. It's fun to mess around with them. Health insurance is not health care, is one of the words that we all spew around. But we need to stick to that a little bit better. Even uh, Rob Young today accidentally used the word health care several times when he really meant health insurance, didn't he? Um, and he's on our side. So we have to be a little bit more careful about that. And words are a very powerful tool, and they've been stolen from us a lot of the time. We all know that the word liberal belonged to us at one point. It was created for our mentality, the, create, the, the mentality of no initiation of force and fraud. But that word got stolen, outright horribly stolen from us. The word conservative, which in Russia meant communist, by about 1989, that was communist. Here in this country, I no longer really know what it means, but <coughs> conservative is you know, slow to change is probably what conservative would probably be thoughtful and careful and slow to change. A lot of people in the room might consider themselves to be conservative. I would ask you, do you want slow change at our national level right now? Or do you want radical, radical, rapid change back towards liberty? Yeah. So maybe we're not conservatives after all. And the talk radio hosts, they all say they're conservative, but they kind of mislead us sometimes too, don't forget. <coughs> So now we have neoconservatism, which God knows what that is, but it, you know, it's founded by the Fabian socialists, so I'm not sure I'm going to trust the neocons. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about groups for a minute, because groups is one of, the that's one of the methods by which we're controlled. We get stuck in groups, either because of the accidental color of our skin, or the religion that we were born into, or because of choices that we make. And that groupisms, the racism, the religionism, the sexisms, those things are totally used against us by dividing the individual away from his own individuality. I'm no longer an individual, I'm just a whatever I am. I'm a gay artist, whatever I am, that's what I am. <clears throat> and I'm thinking just like every other gay artist on the planet. And that's so entirely wrong and we need to fight against that. I never check off on a form whether I'm Latino or black or white, never do it. It's none of anybody's business. It doesn't matter for anything in medicine anymore. I'm not going to determine whether someone has a cardiac risk that's a little bit higher or lower because of their racial profile, because whether it's a 70% chance of an MI or a 30% chance of an MI, there's a chance of an MI, and whether they're black or white doesn't matter to me. <clears throat> but that's just a libertarian mentality again. Another word that we kind of argue about and discuss about, and the, the progressives don't kind of, they have a defense against it. When we use the word fascist, they defend against it by saying, oh, anybody who brings up Hitler, immediately the conversation needs to end because they're obviously psychotic. But it has come to be a point in time in our culture where we need to start thinking about fascism again. And, and Dr. Orient was talking about this appropriately in my view. The Nazis didn't take over Germany from the top down. They took it over from the bottom up as well as the top down. They took over the associations. They took over the culture. They took over the trade unions. If the AMA is not part of a fascist enterprise and the AHA is not part of a fascist enterprise, I don't really know what is. These organizations work with the government to take power away from the individuals, right? Obviously they do. Now, what is a better definition of fascism than when you take groups of people who work with the government using the monopoly power of government to use force to take power away from the individual. That's the nutshell and core of fascism. If Obamacare is not fascist, I can't come up with something that's more so. 
Now, it will be told that, oh, it's not fascist because we're not hyper-nationalist. Okay, well, we're not hyper-nationalist. In Mussolini fascism, he was hyper-nationalist, but okay, so we'll exclude the nationalist, we'll throw in some globalism, and we have some kind of neo-fascism is what's running our country right now. And where is that fascism in our country? Well, I think it's in the government, it's in the government schools, it's in the JCO, it's in the ACGME, it's in the American Board of Medical Specialties, it's in the AMA, it's in the AARP, it's in all these groups that use the power of the government. And if we use the power of the government as in our particular voluntarily joined associations such as this one, to force anything on anybody else, then we're fascist too. But it's just fine to do what we do or what this organization does, which is to use our individuality to fight against those who are using the government against us. The symbol of fascism is kind of an interesting concept. How many people know about this story, what a fascia is? Hmm? It's a symbol of authority. The symbol of authority is often what it's said, yeah. Symbol of authority. Um, you know, it's, it's sticks. The sticks are the individuals. It's wrapped by a tight rope or leather that holds those sticks together. And it's told to us in modern schooling that this is, means Unity provides strength. We all need to stand together because as individuals, we're all too weak. But if we're as a group, we're strong and powerful. This is a Roman symbol, and that's not what they were thinking. The Romans thought the individuals need to stand together in this tall stack, and we're going to hold them together by laws and power and culture. And if they fall out, as individuals fall out of this stick, pile of sticks, we're going to cut them up with that axe head. This was taken on as the symbol of Mussolini, Mussolini fascism, and indeed the word axis, you know, the axis powers of Germany and Italy and Japan, that word axis is derived from the axe on the fascist, on the fasci symbol. The fascism is a thing we fought against, although we did give Mussolini a ticket, ticker tape parade in the early 20s <clears throat> before we realized that fascism wasn't so great. But we also have had fasci, fasci in our own symbolism a great deal, and I'm going to steal something from Dan Brown, who I went to college with. We used to sing next, immediately next to each other in the Amherst College Glee Club. And he's a, you know, he's a uh, author of a, symbolage, of, a, of a guy who's an expert in symbolisms. Do you see the fasci on Lincoln's thing? Is it possible that Lincoln was our, actually our first fascist? Think about it a little bit. Often considered the best president we ever had. He stuck something like 60,000 people into jail without trial during the Civil War. We were one of two countries on the planet that had to have a war to end slavery. How about this? This is our House of Representatives, big American flag, right between two large fasci, hot diggity dog or the mercury dime with a big fascist symbol on there too. It's a symbolism, it's a mentality, and it's really just kind of, you know, it's uh, you know, the paranoid conspiracy theorists concept saying, oh, we're a fascist nation. But this stuff has trickled down into our country, and our kids now are taught with collectivist mentality in the schools. And it's subtle, and it's not so subtle, but it's always there. So I wrote this book to kind of point out those things within the medical system at least, where there is what I, for want of a better term, call fascism. And my two antagonists in the book are the ACGME and, the, and JCO. Um, those are my enemies always, and then most of the administration. Um, in my 15 years at the University of Virginia, where I'm an uh, associate professor and tenured for a little longer until I, I quit in the end of this next month. But um, at that, during my time there, I've seen my university go from a, a place where the administration takes care of the faculty, the faculty are in charge and the administration works for us, to being a university in which the president tells the dean what to do, the dean tells the department chair what to do, the department chair tells the, tells the division heads, and the, and the faculty are sheep, and we are servants. And that's what's happened in academia, and it's not just at my university, it's just about everywhere. With that huge, massive rise that you saw earlier today of the administrators and the number, um, they have an influence, a very powerful influence. We are now sheep in the medical world, and the academic sheep are no different 
um, except that we get this, these sheep, or people who are raised as sheep and residents now who are trained collectively to, um, and they're not put into kind of the same responsibility of training and, and, and uh, responsibility for our patients that, that, um, that we were trained with years ago. <laughs> these residents are gonna be the future uh, heads of the academic societies. This isn't gonna get better without an incredible introduction to the concept of freedom. And even Ron Paul, who maybe isn't as charismatic as we'd like, um, but wonderfully humble, couldn't get people to buy into the freedom concept. I think I was still only the, you know, one of the 1% of voters who voted for Ron Paul. And, and I voted for him back in 88 too. <laughs> um, there's all these acronymal pains in the asses that exist in our world, and if I think if you see an acronym, consider the possibility that it's going to be something that's not our friend, with the exception of the AAPS. <coughs> the, um, <laughs> the dollar bill, money, money is a wonderful thing. This is not money. This is, well, it's temporarily money. This is, this is counterfeit. This is the empowerment of the government of the United States. And one thing we have a lot in common with, probably, is the people who are sitting in on Wall Street, the Wall Street, the whole, that whole Wall Street protest, they're actually, yeah, they're a little bit screwed up, but they had some good points. And one of those points was how much our current monetary, fiat monetary system makes the bankers rich while taking our money. The whole progressive movement is something that it's very hard to deal with. Is it a psychosis? No, it's just a different ideology. It's an ideology that allows them in their mind to force us to agree with them. It's very hard to deprogram that after they've been being taught this way for their entire, entire lives. So how do you deprogram these people? And I think the way to deprogram is to make them laugh. I've yet to have a, have a progressive person read Assume the Physician who didn't laugh and cry and get upset at themselves and sometimes want to quit the profession entirely after reading the book. I've never had any impact in any way with any other kind of argument to try to convince a progressive doctor of, that they're kind of whacked out. Occasionally I'll do something like, um, the pediatricians, most of them are progressive and they'll sit up in front of uh, in a morning report and say how they're, they want us all to sign a petition to make sure that the state, for state of Virginia uh, su legislation supports compulsory physical education uh, for the school kids because there's such an obesity epidemic. Okay, so that, of course, that's a typical progressive thing, you know, compulsory PE. I'd, I would raise my hand and say, you know, my son, he runs a mile in four minutes and 20 seconds. He's got, he does three hours of severe exertion Every afternoon, he's got about a 6% body fat ratio. Which class would you like him to skip, art, music, or philosophy in order to take your mandatory PE? And every now and then, something like that will like, get into their head for a second. But then it falls away with their ideology, and they say, well, it's good for all the other fat kids to make your, your son have the PE. Um, the laughter works a lot better. It's really hard to laugh at yourself, laugh at what you're doing without overcoming a little bit of the internal denial. So I ask you, to be, ask you to kind of help me spread this around a little bit. Um, I'm not gonna go through that slide. Just spread it around if you're willing to. All proceeds I get from this book go to my nonprofit foundation called Trusted Angels Foundation, which supports our work in West Africa. Um, so if it gets spread around and makes a billion dollars, it's all gonna go to a cause of a nonprofit but it's the nonprofit is a libertarian nonprofit. We do entrepreneurial support that is driven to get entrepreneurs in West Africa to make money. And by making money, I mean creating value, which is the only real way to provide health in the long term for children. So I thank you very much for your time. I thank you for this whole association because um, I don't think I've ever given a talk among people who think remotely like this. And by thinking, I mean have the same ideology. Usually I'm presenting to a bunch of my enemy. And it's very nice to be able to present to people who I don't think are. <laughs> so thank you very much. <clears throat>